going to start. Yay, welcome to class. <laughs> oh, they, you guys are so enthusiastic. Um, uh, I have here in my hand a list of questions you guys asked last week. Uh, um, mustered the TA, uh, gathered them together for us. Um, and they're very good questions. Questions I want you to be asking because most of them are questions we'll address in our second plotting lecture. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you what they are. People are asking, how do I apply this to my story relating uh, plotting and promises? That's going to be the main thrust of the, the second lecture on plotting. Um, like I said, I'm going to go down each of the topics once and then revisit them. Um, it just feels like the way that the form of the class works the best. So um, I'll talk about that. And how do I tie my character to a three-point plot? Um, we'll talk about that as well. Um, so if you just kind of keep these things in mind, do your best in your writing, uh, we will eventually get to some of this. Uh, one question was, um, do I need to follow these formats? Uh, which is an excellent question. Um, I want to make it clear that you do not have to follow any specific formula or format for your storytelling. Uh, once again, the things we're talking about in this class are tools that I would suggest that you try out if certain ones feel like they might work for you. Uh, but you're going to have to explore your way through your own writing. Lately, as I've been thinking about writing, um, well, let, let me back up. I, I once heard someone talk about playing games. It was actually a magic card player uh, showing off my nerdiness. I've watched commentary on how to play magic. Um, and he was talking about this idea that the more he played, the more things he used to have to focus on in the game enter his subconscious, and he's able to do them by instinct, uh, keeping track of certain things on a complex board of you know, different states going on, uh, understanding the interactions between certain cards. His instincts would just take over the more he played, and that allowed his conscious mind to focus on certain things he knew he was consistently doing wrong or to higher level problems. And he felt this is the way someone gets better at playing any specific game is by internalizing enough of the easier things that you focus on the harder things. That's what goes on when you practice writing a lot. That's why I emphasize the idea of writing. The more you write, the more you will start to unconsciously do the things that once were hard or not done by instinct for you. Uh, you will start to get a feel for, oh, I need a character moment here. And you'll just put it in as you're writing. And if you step back and analyze it, you'll say, oh, what I was doing there was I was realizing that it was getting too plot heavy. I was losing the sense of character in the scene. I needed to make sure that there was an emotional reaction and connection to the character here. You will do these things naturally, and then you're your conscious brain will start focusing on kind of higher level problems. How do I interweave these plot lines? How do I make sure that the chapter has the right narrative flow so you start a chapter, have rising action, and then have something interesting at the end of every, every chapter? And then that will start to come to you by instinct. And you'll start working on the next level of things. This is why practice is so hard, or so important, is difficult things will become easy and you'll find new difficult things to apply your mind toward. Um, and if you don't practice a whole bunch, these things don't come easily to you. You can still be a fantastic writer without practicing um, as much as some, uh, some other writers have done. But it might take you a lot longer. And you might have to work on things a lot longer. The more you write, the easier this will become for you. Okay? So that's my suggestion. And you're, you're asking um, this idea of, do I have to use any specific format? or formula, no. The more you write, the more you will develop your own methods, and they will probably align with one of these in some ways, but they will probably be very different and distinctive in their own ways as well, and I can't teach you that. I can only suggest to you keep practicing so that you start figuring it out on your own. Um, the next question was, why are penguins' knees so weird? Whoever you are, um, thank you for making me smile. Um, and then the, the other question that I want to address was, how do I make a hero's journey feel new? Is there any way I can approach a hero's journey to make it very interesting? Um, which is a great question. It's a question you should ask regarding kind of all of these plot structures or all of these stories. If everything has been done before, which it probably has been, then why are we sitting here wanting to be writers? Shouldn't we just say, you know what? You know, Tolkien did it. There it is. 
Go read that. Well, yes, reading Tolkien is probably something that people uh, who like fantasy should do. But genres evolve and change. Cultures evolve and change. We as individuals evolve and change. And the genre goes new and interesting places. And what you can add to each story is your own individual take. Each person is an individual, and if you practice the skills we're talking about, your story will naturally start to involve things that you are passionate about. Um, I often say that with plot, plot is the hardest one to be distinctive in, because you know, it's actually pretty easy to have a distinctive plot. You just throw in a twist and turn that no one expected and doesn't make any sense. And boom, you have done something different. <laughs> On chapter three, all your main characters die and you introduce new ones in chapter four, then you kill them in chapter seven and introduce all new characters having a different type of plot and suddenly what used to be you know, a romantic comedy is now a post-apocalyptic wasteland and then you destroy all those characters. And yeah, I mean, you could do this. It would be a story like no one has ever read before and probably it would be very hard to get people to finish it um, because you're jumping around so much. It is actually not hard to be distinctive in plot. It is hard to be distinctive in plot and still tell a good story. But that's okay because we're all going into a book saying, I want to have an experience. This is the type of experience I want to have. That mixture of the fresh, the new, and the, um, the original, the original and the familiar. So where you can go more original is in your characters and your setting. Characters by making characters who are passionate about things that you are passionate about. Uh, you'll notice, if you look through kind of the history of modern fiction, around the time that John Grisham released, all thrillers kind of starred the same type of character. And he came in and said, well, I'm a lawyer. I'm going to write thrillers about lawyers. And they were wildly successful. Um, the plots were not. The character was, characters were very different. It was a fresh take on it. Um, you can bring whatever you are passionate about and, exp and, and experienced in to your writing, and that will add a very distinctive level of freshness to it. I believe it was Stephen King who said, the last thing you should do as a writer is major in English. Um, I majored in English, so uh, it can't be all bad. But what he was getting at is, if you instead focus all of your attention in something that you're really passionate about and interested in, you will find the stories relating to that and you will be able to inject a level of distinctiveness to your stories. And as we talked about during the character time, if you build each character in a way that they don't fit the stereotypes in some way, and maybe they take elements from your life, or your family's life, your friend's life, or something you're really fascinated by, and say, okay, this is a journalist in a medieval fantasy world, because I was a journalism major, and I'm fascinated in the history of journalism, printing press has just been invented, go! That's a different story, simply by taking a different type of character. And if you lend your own enthusiasm for a topic to that story, it, your passion will come through. All right? We are talking about world building today. Uh, so if you remember, we kind of have these, these, these realms we're talking about. We've got plot, setting, character. They all talk about conflict. So we're not going to do a specific day on conflict. But we'll do two on plot, two on setting, two on character, and then two on the box. You can all understand that, right? <laughs> the box is, the, uh, is the, the prose, the way you approach the prose, which we'll start on next week. I'm going to erase that before it looks too embarrassing for too long. Um, world building. World building is, as I've said before, why, why we're all in this class rather than a different writing class. We love world building. As I said in my character lecture, world building should not be at the expense of character, but ideally you're going to do all three of these really well. You're going to have a plot that serves the type of story you want to tell, you're going to have really interesting characters, and you're going to have a distinctive setting. And setting is the place where you can be the most distinctive. Okay? I think that fantasy and science fiction still have a lot of room to explore in setting. Uh, and there are lots of really interesting places that you can go as writers. And I would encourage you to take a few steps forward in what you view as a setting for a fantasy story. This isn't as much of a tr trouble now as it was 10 years ago when I was first teaching this class. Um, it seems like 
late 90s, early 2000s, epic fantasy got in this, this problem where all the new stories had a very similar feel. Similar feel in plot and setting. Um, and there were some, a number of really remarkable bombs in the fantasy industry. Uh, the, most, uh, the most infamous is one called The Fifth Sorceress, um, where what happened is kind of this perfect storm where in the early 90s, epic fantasy exploded in, in popularity. All through the, the, the 80s, it had been gaining. And in the 90s, with, um, with Robert Jordan, with uh, George R. Martin, with Terry Goodkind, and, um, and Robin Hobb, and some of these, these names, uh, a lot of these fantasy books became very bankable. They sold big numbers in hardcover, uh, which the hardcover is what has driven the industry until the e-books kind of changed everything up. And so there was this, this idea that, wow, we can really make a bestseller. It happened, it started with Terry Goodkind, actually. So the story goes, Terry Goodkind had this book, uh, Wizard's First Rule, uh, pretty good epic fantasy, and Robert Jordan missed a deadline, or you know, his books had been coming out one a year. It wasn't that he missed a deadline, but he was going to have two years in between books. And so they slotted in a Terry, this Terry, new Terry Goodkind book in the month when they normally released Robert Jordan books, gave it a bunch, uh, a big push, put a cover on it that was similar, and it became a huge bestseller. Everyone in the industry said, we can now manufacture epic fantasy bestsellers. They bought up a bunch of stuff that felt similar to Robert Jordan or Terry Goodkind, and then they pushed it out with huge advances and lots of money, and they all flopped. Um, and this was kind of an experience of the readership starting to say, wait a minute, this is too much same, too much familiar. Where's our original? And that's at least my take on it. The iceberg. So conventional wisdom um, about world building is this idea that world building is done like an iceberg, that this is what you show in your book, and this is how much you know. Uh, it's a good place to start our discussion of world building, because one of the reasons that people read epic fantasy in particular, but all fantasy and science fiction, is this idea that they want to be immersed in a new place. When Dave taught this class, and I took it all those years ago, he mentioned the fact that the biggest movies of all time consistently shared this idea that they took people to a new time and place. Whether that place was you know, a plantation during the Civil War, or Tatooine, they were all doing very immersive experiences taking people to another time and place. And if you go look at the top 20 box office hits of all time, you will see consistently that the majority of them share this. New time and place and an immersive setting. People go into stories like this, like we usually write, wanting to believe that it's real. And this iceberg theory is one way that you can approach this. Um, if you've listened to Lord of the Rings commentary by actors and directors, they mention that all the actors were given elven underwear to wear, uh, the, the elves were. They all were wearing, you know, um, elven underwear that never appeared. You couldn't see it. It was all covered up, but they were still all wearing elven or elvish, Tolkien scholars, you can tell me what it is, underwear. Um, this iceberg philosophy is the idea of the elven underwear. Even though it's not going to appear on screen, your job is to convince the reader that everyone is wearing elven underwear. Okay? Um, now, the iceberg is one way to do this. Um, the iceberg philosophy is you extrapolate. You spend a lot of time and you build yourself a nice world book. Um, and you are then able to answer some of these questions about your culture and setting so that as you're writing, the reader gets the sense, oh, the author is several steps ahead. I believe that this is real, and the characters are living in a world that exists beyond the page. There are a couple problems with that. Number one, if you're a discovery writer, you might say, uh, that sounds an awful lot like outlining, and I don't like that. Um, that's okay. Actually, a lot, of, um, a lot of discovery writers just write this as they go, and then they later on fill in a bunch of this after they finish their book, and then they do a rewrite that makes sure 
that this part is kind of, you know, the iceberg part is kind of visible under the water a little bit, if that makes sense. Um, this is a good method for a discovery writer to not get paralyzed by the idea that you have to do all of this. You, you say, wow, Brandon writes the Stormlight Archive. Look at how much work goes into that world. He's mentioned before that he's got like 400,000 words of world building. That means I can't even start my book until I've done 400,000 words of world building, and after I do like 20,000, I'm bored of the book and need to move on. That is not necessarily the way you need to approach this, okay? Um, the idea is that you need to give the illusion that there's an iceberg there. You don't actually have to have an iceberg. One way to do it is to have the iceberg, and it is a legitimate way. If you enjoy that, if it makes your storytelling better, then yes, you can make the iceberg. Though pay attention next week when we talk about how to not do this accidentally. Right? Where the reader's like, oh, wow, you've got such an iceberg in this book. Everything is iceberg. Wow. Okay? Uh, the, that's, that's the problem um, with having an iceberg is that oftentimes you want to show it off. You want to be like, I've got an iceberg. Here's the whole thing. And that's real boring real fast in a fantasy novel, uh, let me tell you. So even if you know all of this, you work around giving hints of it. And the way you do this, there are a couple ways you approach it, either to fake it or to do it for real. The idea that um, you dole out information in a very careful way so that the readers are, the, uh, I mean, the characters are never talking about something familiar to them in a way that makes them sound unfamiliar with it. We call, when characters do this, maid and butler dialogue. Okay? This comes from old stage plays where they would have the maid and the butler come onto the stage at the beginning of the play, and they would step up, and the butler would say, as you know, the master is away for the weekend taming some wild horses, and he loves horses. And the maid would say, yes, and as you know, the missus is here alone with the horse master. And he would say, yes, and as you know, and then they would like set up the whole plot by having a conversation about things they already know about, all right? This happens a lot in world building in fantasy worlds where characters are discussing things that they would already know all about. Now, you might be saying, but how do I make sure the reader is not confused if I don't talk about these things? Some general strategies. Number one is your first few chapters Try and construct your story in a way that you don't need to dump a lot of proper names on the reader. And you can do this. You can, um, you can just design the story so your opening chapters are a little more intimate with the character. Um, and rather than saying, on her quest for the magical Glorflink for King Gazorbzub or whatever, she, you just say, you know, she pulled against the wall, breathing heavily as the bandits stomped past and you start to get into who this character is in an intense moment and leave out the proper names. Leave out, you know, dole out your world building in a very gradual sense to bring the, the reader into character first, then into what the character wants, and then into their larger place in the world. This is what we call a learning curve. The idea is that eventually your reader's going to hit this point in their world building, their reading of the world building, where they are an expert in your world, where they understand all the names and terms and things. And your learning curve is how long it takes them to become that expert. Every book has a learning curve, whether or not it's a fantasy novel. Um, Moby Dick has a very steep one, okay? Not a fantasy novel, very steep learning curve, all right? Um, some fantasy books, despite having lots of fantastical things going on, have a fairly shallow learning curve. Harry Potter does a pretty good job of having a relatively shallow learning curve by introducing you to Harry first and the problems that are going on with him and how much he hates being with the Dursleys and how mean they are and weird things are happening until then Hagrid sits him down and says, you're a wizard. Um, and by then you're like, duh, but... You know, the learning curve has shallowly eased you into this to the point that then 
uh, J.K. Rowling can start throwing things at you. So I kind of say Harry Potter's kind of like this gradual, gradual, and then she steepens it once you've got your feet underneath you. Um, you're going to want to decide what your learning curve is for your book. Uh, if you're Steven Erickson, your learning curve looks like that. Um, if you're writing most middle grade fantasies, you want it to be really shallow, um, not very steep at all. That's going to be one of your tools for figuring out how to give the iceberg because you can sprinkle in the occasional term as you go along and have the characters talk about it and let the reader pick up on it by context. Readers like to do this as long as you're not overwhelming them, particularly for the genre and age group you're running for. They like to be like, oh, that's a new term. That's important to the character. Try not to use throwaway terms in your first few chapters just to give spice to the setting. Instead, try to use the terms that are going to be relevant to the character and to the, to the plot so that they become familiar with con through context with those terms. All right? So that's, that's one of your tools for, for showing the iceberg is kind of talking about things as if they're really part of the world. Um, another way that you can do this is you can change something about the world. Change one little thing. Say, you know, every person has um, the ability to summon snowballs into their hands. I don't know. Um, and you change this one little thing, and then you ask yourself, what are the three questions that readers are going to immediately ask? You know, you go ask people. You brainstorm. The three things they're going to assume. And then over the course of the next couple of chapters, you put in four things, right? that the reader might have thought of. And they'll start to trust that you've extrapolated, you know, OK, if everyone can summon snowballs, then um, you know, there are no water shortages ever in this world. And um, also, people get carry around shields to block the snowball fights when they happen. Or you know, whatever it is, people refrigerate their drinks by like making a snowball and stuffing their drink into it. Um, if you start showing the everyday life of a world where everyone can snow, um, summon snowballs, what you're doing is you're promising. What you're really doing is you're saying, here's this thing right here. I'm showing you really a big depth on this one aspect of the world. And then you will trust me when I mention these other cultures and, um, and things in our world, and I don't have to dig so deep into those because you're already invested in the world. You know that the, that the reader, the, um, the author is ahead of you, and it gives the illusion of the whole iceberg by only showing a few pieces of it. Okay? And if you even know the whole iceberg, then you probably want to avoid doing this by doing some of these same strategies. Questions on the iceberg. Go for it. So do you think that sometimes people make a mistake by in the prologue, maybe giving away too much like backstory or what's going on? Yeah, historically in fantasy, the prologues have been one of the big problems. Um, and if you're going to be a chef instead of a cook, what you want to be asking yourself is, what is the prologue? What purpose does it serve? Does it establish tone for me later on, like we talked about? It's a good use of a prologue. If the prologue's job is to say, OK, Basically, you need to know all this stuff. There'll be a test on page 50. Then that's going to bore a certain percentage of the readers, me included. Okay? Um, and I, fantasy books have kind of picked up on this. Remember, fantasy is kind of an infant genre still. Um, the first really big fantasy books post-Token post didn't come around until 78 or something like that. So when so Sword of Shannara came out. Um, and that's around when the David Eddings books started getting published and things like that. Uh, Anne McCaffrey was before that, but she didn't count hers as fantasy. Um, but b before that, you still had some fantasy, but you did not have bestsellers, right? It was uh, the first actual post-Tolkien fantasy bestseller was, I believe, uh, one of the Thomas Covenant books. Um, and so... That's early 80s, right? This is a genre. And so you read a lot of these books from the early 80s, and people are like, well, Tolkien had these huge appendixes. Let's put those on the front so that people know what's, what's happening. People love those appendixes. And they put them all on the front, and thus readers are like, yeah, 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 skip that. OK, story. Um, and then we'd maybe go back and read it and become an expert, because we're nerds, and we've got to do that. Um, <laughs> but you can see, you see what I'm saying? Now, if you know what purpose your prologue is serving and why you're doing what you're doing, prologue can be an excellent tool. 
But if it is, let's info dump. You have given me a prologue so that I can dump all of this on top of you. Um, you're probably going to have um, a bad experience with that prologue. A lot of editors are going to suggest that you cut it, and readers are going to be bored and put off by it. Yes? So I know like, one of the joys of writers is to like, hold on to that iceberg and like, yes. these big mysteries. Yep. And really like, play with the minds of the readers. When are there ways to tell if you're doing it too much? If you're, like, it yeah, the ways, there are ways to tell if you're doing it too much um, and things like this. Number one, up front, you want to be more sparse if you can and focus on character. Once the reader trusts you, you can start to dig into it more as long as you are giving them payoffs on what you're giving them. Not everything, but if you give a couple of good payoffs, you say, you know, it's one of these things, like if you're paying detailed attention, you will notice that, you know, this certain aspect of the setting becomes a very important aspect by the end of the book. The reader's like, wow, I feel rewarded for paying attention to what you were doing, therefore I'll pay more attention in the future to these things. Um, and it's kind of like every book re the reader has to buy in to an extent. This is import particularly important in fantasy and science fiction, right? If a reader picks up your book and was reading on page 400, there's a decent chance it will just sound ridiculous if they read it out loud, OK? Um, and so reader buy-in is so important. And you need to get them to say, yes, I'm there with you. Yes, these things are, these people are called Jedi. That might sound silly, but it's actually awesome. They have laser swords. Stay with me. Like, you've got them to need them to be willing to say, yes, it's a giant plastic mask, but you know what? He's really scary. Um, and if they don't do that, your book fails for them. They come out of it saying this was ridiculous, it was hackneyed, um, and things like this. And you do that by giving them just enough and making it feel real and then making good on those promises. Not making these details throw away, but making them relevant in some way. Again, not every one of them, but enough of them that the reader feels like their expertise is paid off. One of the reasons why the series is so popular, particularly in science fiction and fantasy, is because of this learning curve. Once you get here, you say, OK, I am now an expert. I want to take your 50-page tests on your world. Throw them at me. I've spent all this work. And so, yes, while the next book may you know, heighten the learning curve a little bit, really the idea is that now that you are invested in this world and these characters and feel like an expert, you now want to just enjoy the ride for a little while. That's the kind of explains, really, the fantasy epic series. Um, you want to get an ending, but you also want to use your expertise. Other questions on the iceberg? Now, we will talk next week about how to avoid info dumps in kind of a specific line-by-line -line way where we'll talk about, all right, here's how you can kind of write some lines of dialogue. Uh, one tool I want you to make, to make you aware of is um, a Watson. One way to dig into this a little bit without feeling like a maiden butler, if you feel you need to, is to make sh a character in your book someone who is unfamiliar, um, as Watson was unfamiliar with Holmes. That's why we use him as a stand-in. Um, but Bilbo fulfills some of the same um, things in The Lord of the Ring, or in the, the Hobbit. He is the little hobbit from a world that's a lot more like ours than the rest of the world of Lord of the Rings. You ever notice that? He lives in kind of, uh, you know, a suburb of London, kind of. Um, and then he leaves the suburb of London, and lo and behold, epic fantasy world. Uh, this is a, I don't know if it was a specific choice on Tolkien's part, but it is a great tool. Same thing with Harry. He lives in the outer world and transitions in. Or you have some sort of character along for the ride who's like, wait a minute, I am from the Elven lands. Why do you use these utensils? Rather than just snorting the food up through your hole, the hole in your forehead, or whatever it is that they do. And you have these, these opportunities for explanation between these two characters where you can reveal some of this by having discussions, arguments, points of tension, and conflict between two different people from different backgrounds. You see this a lot in stories. That's part of the reason for it. Now, um, when I approach world building, one of the main things that I do is I split in my head between two different types of world building. And today we're not going to talk about magic systems. We'll do that during the next uh, one. That's a big topic. 
Um, mainly because I'm really interested in it. For other professors, it might be like five minutes. But for me, it's a lecture. Um, but I split my world building into what I call the physical setting and the cultural URL setting. All right, physical and cultural setting. This is to help me attack the problem. Now, once again, if you're a discovery writer, this is not necessarily things you need to be doing up front, but it might help for you to divide in your head how to approach some of this stuff. Um, the physical setting is all this, the world building stuff that would exist even if the humans weren't there. Okay? So, this is things like, let me brainstorm some for me. What, what kinds of things world building uh, has to do with physical setting? Grass that disappears. Okay, your flora and fauna. Okay, what else? The geography. Geography, that's a good one. What else? Weather. Weather, yep. What else? How many suns does your play? Yeah, yeah, your cosmology or whatever. The actual cosmology, not the foundation myths or things like this, the astral, actual astronomy and things like that. Yeah. What else you got for me? Wow. We covered it all that quickly? <laughs> um, yeah. Wildlife. Okay, wildlife. Uh, this kind of falls under the flora and fauna, but yeah, wildlife. Go for it. The geology. Geology, yes. Yes. Sciences, <laughs> science stuff, um, laws of physics. I, I actually kind of put the magic over here, the, the idea of what, what laws of physics am I changing? Um, how am I tweaking? This is for me because I like science-based magic. You do not need to make a science-based magic. But if I'm going to approach, I'm going to be like, all right, I'm breaking the laws of thermodynamics. What's up with that? Um, that's useful for me as a writer. Um, but these were all great things. This is, this is basically what we're looking at. Now, this one goes a bit bigger. Um, let's brainstorm what kinds of world building can you do with your cultural setting. Go. Swearing. Swearing. Okay, curses. Well, did not expect that to be the first one. Okay. <laughs> Economy. Economy. All right. Right. Religions. Religion. Okay. Um, right here. Laws. Laws. Go for it. Right. Okay, go ahead. A political setting. Okay, politics. And government. Okay. Um, landmarks or wonders of the world. Okay, okay. Wonders. Landmarks. That kind of straddles between this, right? Um, Go ahead. Caste system. All right, your caste system, if you have one. Customs and philosophies. Okay, customs and philosophy. All right, in the back. Food. Food lore. Ooh. Is Dr. Thursby still teaching at uh, BYU? in the folklore department. Dr. Thursby is great. She knows a lot about food lore. Um, she's, a, she's a folklorist. So I would recommend aspiring fantasy writers take a class from Dr. Thursby. I took four, I think. They were really helpful. Language. Languages, yes. All right. Music. Music. Yeah. Fashion. Fashion. All right, in the way back. Folklore. Folklore, oh, folklore. I love folklore. Folklore classes are great. Gender roles. Gender roles, good. Um, all right. Weapons slash technology. Yes, weapons and tech. Technology was generally driven by two forces in our, uh, our society, or really three, but really two. You know, who on beating up other people and trying to find out better ways to, to get from point A to point B, usually so you can beat up different people. <laughs> History. History. 
And the other one was how to grow more food so that your armies are better fed, so you have larger ones so you can beat up other people better. <laughs> okay, human rights. Or non-human rights, yes. Uh, prejudices. Prejudices, yeah. Okay. Education. Yeah, education. How do people get their learning? Okay. Laws of war. Okay, yeah, laws of war. Okay, so, yeah. Courtship. Courtship, ooh, yeah. <laughs> you can put that under laws of war. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was really surprised when, um, you know, I went on my mission and came back, and while I was gone, my family moved to Idaho from Nebraska, okay? And my sisters were teenagers. They're 10 years younger than me, 10 and 12 years. And so I get back from my mission, and there's like, there, to go on a date, oh my goodness, going on a date, getting asked on a date, was like this crazy thing. Is it still this way? Like, the boy would come over, and he would like do this weird thing, and there would be like a 10-foot pinata in the driveway, and then you hit it, and fireworks went off, and they spilled out something out of order, and you had to rearrange the letters, and it took you to a place across the city where there was a secret person who asked for a code word, and if you gave it to him, they gave you a coin that if you put in a certain coin-operated thing, it would say, will you go to the dance with me, Jane? Right? <laughs> Right, what's that? It's, it's what? It's just for dances. It's just for dances, but I mean, in Nebraska, I called her and said, do you want to go to the dance with me? And she said, yes or no. Here, Jane's like, all right, I gotta come up with something bigger than the giant pinata, you know, thing. Um, courtship can change a lot depending on even within what we would assume is, assume is one culture. You know, Mormon culture in Nebraska was kind of different from Mormon culture in Idaho Falls as regard to these sorts of things. So, courtship, yeah. Uh, was there one other hand? Yeah, go for it. Architecture. Architecture, yeah, it's great. All right, now I want you to think, look at these, this thing on the wall and think, how many fantasy books have I read that really only ever deal with like this one and this one, maybe this one, right? Um, how many, in, they, they, they can be great books, but how many of them, I mean, how many fantasy books or science fiction books deal with education, deal with courtship, uh, you know, deal with philosophy, deal with food lore? I guess apparently George R. R. Martin does a lot of that, um, but um, deals with, you know, all of this stuff. Um, there is so much to extrapolate. In fact, we could probably, if we put our minds to it, come up with two more whiteboards full of things that we could talk about that are all kind of distinct from these ideas. This is why I say that there's lots of room in fantasy. One of the things we haven't even talked about is, you know, jobs. I should mention that up there. This is economy. Economy, yeah. Um, and then there's kind of this idea of what in your fantasy setting, what kind of jobs exist that don't exist in our world? That could be really interesting. We're, we'll, we'll stop with those for right now, and I'll ask for questions in a minute. Now, you may look at all this, and your response may be, iceberg crashing me! Um, and this is where we start talking about Grandpa Tolkien. Okay? Now, Grandpa Tolkien kicked off epic fantasy. Uh, you're now getting the philosophy of fantasy according to Brandon Sanderson, but I see three general strange strains of fantasy, all right? We have got our person from our world gets sucked into a bizarre fantasy world, experiences bizarre things, and comes home. Uh, the Alice in Wonderland, the, uh, the Narnia, a lot of these have been, uh, have been middle grade or teen. Um, Harry Potter, um, all of these things. Um, we have kind of another strain, which is manly man by himself fights a lot of stuff, maybe takes his shirt off, and then probably dies. <laughs> Unless you want to write a whole bunch of books about him, and then he won't die. Um, and this is, this is actually, this kind of started, this is the, the Conan strain. Um, John Carter of Mars, um, or Princess of Mars, as the book was called, is one of these. But they've, they've kind of matured and developed over the years to kind of the gritty, um, low magic, 
uh, fantasy stories generally about people who live in terrible situations murdering each other. Uh, Joe Abercrombie is doing this right now. And uh, the, the genre, of course, has matured a whole bunch. Uh, David Gemmel, an author I really like. Uh, the Ellerick books, um, another series that I, that I enjoy by Michael Moorcock. These are all kind of in this line, right? Um, this is man doesn't control magic. Magic controls, magic's usually unknown, scary, different. It shares a little bit with the horror strain, which is kind of a, a cousin of fantasy. Um, the whole idea of this, you know, we don't know what it is, and we probably are going to go kill the wizard, and if not, we're going to get cursed and something really bizarre is going to happen. Is this Grimdark? Uh, Grimdark is the modern manifestation of this, yeah. Grimdark is kind of the modern now. The thing that happened is the third strain is epic fantasy. Um, large cast, fate of the world generally um, at stake, kicked off by Tolkien, lots of world building, generally high magic. You have main protagonists who are using magic in some way, um, and this sort of thing. Um, that's the kind of epic fantasy strain. And then you had George R. R. Martin in the 90s, who's like, I'm going to put one foot in, um, in the heroic and one foot in epic fantasy. And they're really more like 75% epic fantasies with 25% in the kind of what I call the heroic, the grimdark. Um, and he kicked off a kind of resurgence of the grimdark, but it existed way before. Elric was to is totally grimdark. A black company is kind of another one that's an example of this. And so you've got these kind of three strains of fantasy. Uh, science fiction is a, another beast entirely. Um, so with fantasy, we have this understanding. We're like Grandpa Tolkien, he kicked off our, our, our subgenre for epic fantasy writers, uh, for people like me. And there's this sense that we need to do as much world building as Grandpa Tolkien did if we're going to justify writing epic fantasies. How much time did Grandpa Tolkien spend on his world building? He never stopped. He never stopped is the right answer, yes. But it's like three or four decades. I think it's 20 years is like the number I've heard bandied around the most, but I don't think there's an official number. That's just he loved this world building. He loved languages. He loved coming up with all this lore, and his books were almost more a vehicle to get his lore out to people, and the plot was like something you, he had to put in as a necessary evil to get people to experience the awesomeness of his lore. He said he wanted to create a new mythology for England because he felt like they didn't really have their own, um, at least his culture within uh, the UK did not, and so he's creating this mythology, Middle Earth, um, to go along with that. So there's the sense that we need to do that. Um, there's a problem with that. Now, I should say, if you want to spend 30 years world building a really awesome world because that's what you love, there's nothing at all wrong with that. If that's, you know, the whole idea is that we're doing what we, what we want to do, what we enjoy. You get out of this class what you want to get out of it. Don't, don't come into it assuming, you know, you need to be such and such or something. However, I teach the class under the assumption, as we've said, that you want to be making a living off of your um, science fiction or fantasy fiction sometime in the next 10 years. If you want to be making a um, living off of your fiction in the next 10 years, you can't spend the next 30 world building before you start. Okay? And there's this danger of what we call world builder's disease. This is where someone spends so much time world building that they never get around to their story. And if they do get around to their story, they really feel like they need to drop the whole iceberg on you because they spent five years on this world building. They're going to use it, darn it, right? That is not necessary, I would say. What I would recommend is that you pick something on this board or one of your own. You pick two or three things, and what you're looking for is something that really pops off the page and is unique. Something that is at the foundation of what the conflict is going to be in your story, or at least one of the character conflicts. And then you be as wildly original with that thing as you can be, and you try to extrapolate it as far as you can go. Um, this is kind of like building a mini iceberg, like I said, in this one area. The whole, you can summon um, snowballs in your hand. What do you do with that? You make that an interesting plot point. You make that the center of your story, and you pick a couple of these things and say, we're going to do with education, laws, and prejudices. I'm writing a fantasy attorney who is defending, you know, these fairies who have been exploited 
uh, for whatever reason. And that's what's interesting to me. But, you know, she's a law student. And so education, laws, and, uh, and prejudices. And then you maybe spend your physical world building on the flora and fauna so you know what kind of species these are that are being exploited. And you dig deep in that. And then you let yourself say, you know what? I may not have to spend a lot of time on the languages. The fairies can magically speak our language. I will just not, I will just leave that out entirely. They speak our language. I'll put a little flourish on it and say, when they speak in their own tongue, it sounds musical, kind of like, um, you know, a, a scale going up and down. And then you leave it at that. One line of world building for the languages. Um, you maybe say, you know, this society, we're not going to worry about caste system or things like that. You know, we might touch on the politics and some of the food, but, you know, for right now, we don't have to deal with the philosophy or even, you know, I won't deal with the economy. I'll make my main character say, yeah, this all works. Not sure how the money works, but it all works. I, you know, if you can make a character who is interested in certain things, you can dig deeply into them, or you can just start saying, how do these things affect these other things? And that's my world building. We touch on folklore because we world build the history of the fairies and all of our folklore deals with interaction with the fairies. What you do when you leave out food for them, how you trap them, what you do with their curses or their blessings. This really targets your world building and it will start to feel very expansive as it's touching on a bunch of different topics, but you don't have to go everywhere. The other important element of this is being distinctive in a few points of your world building. Don't just say, I'm going to write another generic medieval fantasy with whatever name comes to my, um, to my mind taking place in a forest village that there are elves and dwarves and they're basically the same ones that were in Tolkien. Oh, and I need to go find the magic sword again. Nothing wrong with Sword of Shannara. That was a great book. Um, but we don't need 20 copy, uh, clones of Sword of Shannara, right? Sorry, Shannara. Sh I, he always, I used to say Shannara, and then I met him, and he's like, yeah, I say Shannara, and I'm like, oh, okay. So I changed my mind to saying Shannara, and now the television show went back to Shannara, and T I asked Terry, he's like, yeah, everyone says it that way, so I just decided to go ahead, and I'm like, ah! Now I can't, I don't even know what it is in my head anymore, Terry. Um, so, but do you get this idea that Picking a couple of things that you're really interested in, making them distinctive and interesting, having either a new form of government or folklore in a way that doesn't exist in our world, and digging into it deeply and having a character passionate about it can really cover a lot of your world building and make your world feel more, way more real than if you had a 100,000 uh, word Bible um, for your world and you made sure at every opportunity to mention the history of that hill and that type of architecture and what type of food that they eat in this country that we've never been to before. Questions? Go ahead. With the, with the physical setting, if you're, if you're making a lot of changes yes. in your world, how soon do you want to start actually like announcing like this looks different? I mean like yeah, make it, you know, tie, tie it in with the, yeah. the actual plot, but how soon do you start Set, like setting How soon can you start setting? This is a good question, and it really depends on the type of story you're telling. A lot of stories I will lead with, this world is bizarre and this is why, but I'll do it in a way that says, this character is having to deal with this aspect of the world um, so that we get a character in a strange situation. You know, this is a world where everyone lives on um, flat, you know, plains uh, of rock, like cliff faces, right? Because on the tops of the cliffs, there are monsters that eat them. Right? And so you therefore start your story with you know, your character hanging from one of these lines and she's crawling up and she gets on top and sees the monsters and like runs and steals an egg and then you know, jumps off with her lines. And so, so you're like, okay, this is a weird physical setting, but we're making the initial conflict of the story in a way to introduce how that setting works. Um, if it's not that integral or integral, I'm not sure which way you say it. Um, if, you, if you're not, what's that? Is it integral? Is it like, like the math? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, if you're not making it that integral to what you're doing, um, then you maybe just leave it off and have it be mentioned in a story, and then you can bring it up in the sequel, right? Um, the, everything in between is also possible depending on the type of character writing in your conflict. 
Um, I don't make a big deal of some of these. I don't make a big deal of the fact that in the Stormlight Archive, the year is longer than our year. Um, and so characters that are 18 are actually 19 or 20. It's about, about you get an extra year for every 10. Um, I don't make a big deal of that because, you know, starting the book and saying, she was 18, but she felt like she was 20. Um, just as there's no way to do that without, you know, without feeling weird or digging into, you know, they go through puberty. And then, I don't know. Like, it just doesn't, it's not a big deal. Um, and then when people find it out, they're like, ah, oh, okay. Um, so there are a lot of things like that for learning curve purposes, purposes I don't make a big deal of. I don't make a big deal of the fact that if you met most of the people in Alethkar, you'd be like, oh, they're Asian. Um, people all imagine them basically how they want to imagine them. Um, but this is because I want to make sure that the learning curve on the things that are really bizarre, like the storms and the spren, are where the focus and attention of the reader is going, not on. So they have 0.7 gravity, and there's extra oxygen, so the fires are behaving strangely. I don't want to make a big deal of that in chapter one, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, other questions about some of this stuff? Yeah. So it seems like, especially when you're thinking about learning curve, you want to think about it in terms of like character as your vehicle. Yes. And if you decide not to have a Watson, a Watsonian type yes. character, what are some... Like, what are some other ways, um, if you're not going to have a Watson? Um, one of the ways is to have write an introductory sequence like the, the girl I described climbing the wall and stealing an egg, which will tell you immediately to your reader, okay, they live in these weird places. We know why it's dangerous up on top and they don't go there, but we know that they like, you know, we know what their food s source is right now because she stole an egg, she jumped off the wall, she now went to her house that's like built like one of those, um, those nests that birds build on the side of, uh, on the side of cliffs, right? Um, if you have an introductory sequence that shows each of these things, you have set up a whole bunch about the world and never had to say, she lives on a cliff, monsters are up above and they will eat you, and we sometimes steal their eggs. You have just shown us a scene that does that. You don't need to say a single word of any of those things, and you've set it all up. Because it was important to the character, and we're with the character. Now, in that scene, because it's so weird what's going on, that's where you really want to avoid a lot of proper names. You want to avoid you know, having her reminisce about her whole family and their names and how they're going to be hungry if she doesn't bring home the food. Instead, when she brings home the food, you introduce a few of them and say, thank goodness your brother hasn't been able to bring home food for three days. We were running out of stores. You've just established all that. Or you just make her really anxious and getting it, really desperate. Um, you don't have to say all of these things and bog the reader down with details they don't need in the moment. And that's how you do it if you're not going to use a Watson. Um, and introduce these things slowly by context. Okay? All right. Other questions on this? Yeah. How much research would you do? Like, you're like, oh, I want to create a religion. How much research would you do in, in religions and that sort of thing without, well, while still being original, but yeah. kind of having it pattern? Oh, good question. Um, so this, as most things in the class, can go several ways. Uh, one of the ways is you, if there's something you need to have an expertise in and you don't have it, my method is generally to try and get myself like 75% of the way there. Uh, a good example of this is in Stormlight Archive, I wrote a character who's the son of a doctor and he's learned medicine. At least, you know, Renaissance level understanding of medicine. So I needed to know how to do field surgery and things like this. I went and read up on it for a day or so. Understood as more than a day or so, but you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like I was taking, going and getting a, um, a, an MD, right? Um, I read up on it, I read some books, um, I looked at it, then I wrote him as best I could, then I gave it to a field surgeon who was a, uh, was a medic in, the, uh, in the, the military, and I said, what I get wrong? And he said, oh yeah, you did this wrong and this wrong, otherwise it's really good. The idea for that is to get yourself as close as you can get with a reasonable amount of time spent, it's like that last 20% of expertise is what takes the seven extra years, right? Um, you get yourself there so you're, you're not constructing your story on really faulty um, premises, and then you find an expert to help you out. Uh, this works really well, uh, particularly 
if it's something like that you can research. Now, your question was a little bit more along the lines of, so I research earth religions. How much research do you do? And then how do you make use of that? Um, this is a little bit touchier of a subject because the idea is being inspired from what's happened on earth is basically the only way you can be inspired. Human beings, um, I think I've talked about it, what we do is we're really good at combining things. We're not that great at imagining something brand new. Uh, a taste that we've never tasted, a color we've never seen. It's just not something our brains do. But saying, I'm going to put a, a horn on a horse and make a unicorn, we do that really well. Um, and so taking patterns and extrapolating from them is how we, we approach things. The danger is when you stray into something where you are saying, this is not the Catholic Church, but it's exactly like the Catholic Church, and they're all evil. Um, right? Um, this is where you approach saying, I'm going to put a straw man in my book that is a very, very weak copy of something in our world. Uh, and that is something you really want to stay away from doing. Okay? Um, that doesn't mean you can't look at what the Catholic Church did. Um, it's rise and be uh, inspired by it and build something that is, a, um, that is you know, a church that has shares some of these aspects. But what you want to do is make it your own, make it tied into the world, and anything you're putting in your book like this, you should try to show a well-rounded viewpoint of. Uh, this is particularly important if you are writing the other, writing someone different from yourself. Um, you want to make sure that you get inside the mindset of people who are like this, and you present their arguments or their way of life in a way that they would want it presented. Nothing bothers me more than reading a book full of atheists with that one person who believes who is a complete idiot and who has shown every step of the way why they're an idiot. I would be fine reading a book full of atheists if the one person who believed like I did actually made the good arguments, right? The right arguments, the arguments that I would make and had everyone say, yeah, you're not an idiot. You're wrong, but you're not an idiot. I'm okay with, the, with that. Does, do you see that distinction? Um, and I'm using it for religion um, because it's a little bit less of a hot button topic. But when you're approaching your world building, one of the things that a lot of people do is they take a real world culture and they say, well, I'm gonna extrapolate this. Um, on one hand, that's again, the only way that we, uh, we do things like this. And it is very cool when it's done well. Guy Gabriel Kay has made an entire career of taking an earth culture, creating a fantastical version of it, and writing um, a fantasy historical novel. But if that culture becomes a caricature, suddenly you've strayed into something that gets really offensive really fast. This is not an argument for not putting the other. In other words, you should try to approach things that are different from yourself and write characters who are different from yourself, believe differently than you, look differently than you. You should not make every character a carbon co uh, copy of yourself. But what you should be doing is trying to approach these things in ways where you are approaching them from different directions, where you're talking to people who actually believe this or um, live this life and using them appropriately. Um, to, to get into this, um, let's erase this for a second um, in a way that might be a little more understandable. Um, if you will indulge me for a minute, we can talk feminist theory for a short time. I know you probably did not expect that in your epic fantasy writing class, but here we go. Um, this is a way that you can understand it. Um, traditionally, when people first start out, men tend to be pretty poor at writing women, and women tend to be pretty poor at writing men. It is a lot more obvious when the guys are writing the women. Um, <laughs> this is something you're going to have to deal with, and it's kind of a microcosm for approaching any, of, any type of the other, whether it's a different culture or a different belief from yourself. Um, and you'll notice kind of some levels of subtle sexism that happen that we all do accidentally when we're writing, and if we become aware of them, it is easier to overcome them. Like the first one is what you would normally assume, right? The level one sexism is um, woman as object, right? All the women in the book, there's usually not very many of them, and if there are, they have 
no real relevance to the plot. They, uh, they are only exist to, to be moved around like pieces on the board um, uh, so that the manly men can go around being manly. You're probably all going to recognize when something is that sexist. Um, but the, the thing is, once you try to get past it, um, you get into things that are actually still problematic. And this is kind of the paragon. Something to be watch out for when you're writing. A lot of writers, I did this early in my career too, um, in my unpublished books, fortunately. We'll get to the ones that I did in published books. But in the unpublished books, I did this. Uh, the paragon is where you take the other and you say, OK, I know I can't be racist slash sexist or whatever. So I will make sure that there is a character in my book who exemplifies the other, and they are awesome. There's only one of them, but they are awesome. They are good at everything, right? Um, they, there is nothing wrong with them, and I make sure that I am not sexist by doing this. Um, I remember, this is racism rather than sexism, but I remember playing a video game. I, I don't know if I told you guys this story. T stop me if I told you this story, but there was, um, right, the, the manly men were fighting in this video game, right? And they're all like exactly the same dude, right? Except, you know, with, with different size chins. Um, and they're all fighting, you're playing along, and they mention, oh, I hope that other character whose name is obviously black is okay out there, right? And you get along eventually, and the guys get trapped, and they're fighting like, we will never survive. And then, like, black guy bursts through the wall <laughs> with, like, two giant machine guns, shoots all the bad guys, says, roar! Um, and then they're like, high five, black guy. And then he like never gets to do anything else or have a character arc for the rest of the game. He was just there to be like, we're not racist. We have a paragon, OK? Women do this with men, too. Um, but kind of level three is kind of a variation of, of, uh, of a paragon where you're now having multiple of the other. You know, you're having multiple girls in your story, but they still don't have, get to have quirks or character arcs. They're always the authority figure. Um, you'll notice this in a lot of, like, if you guys read web comics, a lot of the early web comics. The opposite gender of the writer is going to be the person who is like the straight man or woman in the comic. You know, and it's always the main character, the, the, the author's ones they identify with, getting into the goofy problems, and the other one shaking their head. Um, there are, you'll find this a lot in romance stories, either one of these, where the woman is like this full, vibrant character with passions and dreams, and the guy exists to nod and be like, that was, that was a little bit dangerous of you to do. I wish that you wouldn't be so careless, you know. And he, she's like, oh... He's just so, you know, good and good-natured, and I don't deserve to be with him. And he, like, broods, um, <laughs> right? Uh, guys do this, too, just as bad um, with the women. Um, what the idea is that where, where this is wrong, and then you have, like, level four, um, where you finally have, like, you have, like, a full, well-realized character, and then, um, then there is only one. Right? There's only one girl in the book. She's a fully realized character. She has passions, dreams, she has quirks, she has flaws, but she happens to be the only, char the only female character in the entire book, or the only male. That doesn't happen very often at all. But this is the idea where you're still defaulting to like you for all the side characters. You'll have like one really well-developed minority character, and then everyone around them is default to white male if you're a guy. Um, I'm not saying that you can't write books about a bunch of white guys. That's fine. There are plenty of good books. It's just when this becomes a theme in your writing, you start to say, oh, what I'm doing is I'm engaging in tokenism. I'm engaging in woman as object or the Smurfette principle. You can Google that one if you want to know more about it. I'm making all of my, the people different than me a paragon so that I make sure that I'm not racist or sexist, but I'm not letting them be real characters. And what you're really striving for is getting to this kind of this level where you are thinking of each character, where they each have quirks, dreams, passions, um, where they are all in some way um, in, important to the story that they are part of. They don't have to be the main character, but they have sort of an independence and uh, an agency over their destiny, um, where they're allowed to be flawed, um, 
One of the best ways to avoid tokenism is to force yourself, and this is a big problem in fantasy, um, not with necessarily minorities, but different races. You're like, you've got this one from this culture, this one from this culture, this one from this culture, and every person from this culture is a sneaky thief with a wise tongue. Every person from this culture is a large, burly man who carries a sword and doesn't get jokes. Um, you know, and these sorts of things, if you want to have a really m more fleshed out fantasy story, you say, this person and this person are from the same city. And this one is like this and this one is like that. Or you say, I have two dwarves in my book. They're both wildly different from one another to show the breadth of how this is an actual real culture rather than people um, who speak with a Scottish accent and carry an axe. Um, does that make sense to you? Is it, why would this be important? Tell me this. Why, why is this relevant? Why are we even talking about this in a fantasy class? This builds a major character. This gives you somewhere to go. Yes. Yes. This, this, is, this is where we're getting away from our flat characters to our gauging characters. Well, we're building an entire world, and worlds are not populated by white males. By only white males who, yeah, yeah, who all talk the same. Go for it. Uh, it goes into the iceberg. Yeah, yeah. That's the bottom of the iceberg. Yeah. I might not see all of it. Right. 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 Uh, anyone else? These are also mistakes that we have all made. These uh, mistakes we've all made. Kind of all laid out in one yeah. setting so that you can recognize them. Yeah. Yeah. And I've I've done some of this, like I said, in published books. Fortunately, I don't think I've ever done like the first one or two. But uh, you know, I, the further you get down the list, the more you'll be able to find it in published writers and be like, oh, they're doing this. It, one of the things to understand is it's okay to realize that you've been racist or sexist in a small way and say, oh. I'm going to make sure I'm not doing that anymore. Um, and it's, n we've made it this big insult to say, that was kind of racist. And you're like, no, I'm not a racist. Well, you're not saying you're racist. You're saying that you're, you, you're, you're falling into one of these traps. That's the way our minds, minds think. We do it. It's OK to be like, oh, yeah, it was kind of racist. OK, I'll deal with that. I'll try to make sure that as I'm approaching it in fiction in the future and my own mindset, I'm not doing the same thing. All right, any other questions? Um, we'll go ahead, and uh, I didn't get to the application part because I went on a sexism diatribe, um, but there wasn't enough time for it anyway. So we'll do that next week where we'll talk about taking some of these things and we'll brainstorm some cultures, um, and we'll go from there, okay? All right, guys, thank you very much. Camerapanda.com allows you to find cameras and lenses like no other site. Find the Nikon Coolpix cameras with the highest base ISO, or Canon cameras with full-frame sensors. Find Sony E-mount zoom lenses ordered by Aperture in just three clicks. CameraPanda.com shows you prices from up to 30 different sellers. CameraPanda.com striving to be the world's best camera and lens shopping site.